degree more easily. Yeah. I will stop at uh, 12. Uh, sure. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the invitations. Uh, it's always nice to be back in Adelaide. Um, I, uh, I was promised that one doesn't have to speak about differential geometry from the differential geometry seminar. Um, very little that could be called differential geometry, even, even remotely, is in here, but um, perhaps there's still some interesting things here. Um, in fact, I realized, mostly after preparing this talk, uh, that uh, last time I spoke in Adelaide, I actually spoke on a very similar topic, and I looked back at my notes on that last talk, and they were terrible, and I really apologize for giving a crappy two technical talk last time I was here, if you remember it. This one, even though it's similar material, will hopefully be a little bit uh, friendly. Okay, so, uh, right. yep, let's get going. So, uh, I'm going to start at the beginning, giving you a bit of an introduction uh, to what I mean by quantum symmetries, and a bit of the story of why we're studying them in the first place, uh, and eventually we'll, I'll, I'll get on to some uh, of the exotic aspects of quantum symmetry that uh, we're trying to study these days. So this is sort of the, the, the four points I want to make at the beginning, uh, motivating the idea of studying quantum symmetries. So uh, maybe uh, at the end of the day, uh, this is the reason to study them. Uh, quantum symmetries are, are meant to be a mathematical model of, of topological phases of matter. Uh, these are things that are studied in condensed matter physics. There was a Nobel Prize for them a few years ago. People have proposed building all sorts of interesting devices, including possibly quantum computers, using topological phases of matter. Uh, and uh, various forms of quantum symmetry have been used very successfully by physicists studying this. So, working back on just a little bit, uh, the, the reason why quantum symmetries, in the form that I'll explain in a moment, are good mathematical models for topological phases of matter is that. They are algebraic gadgets that uh, determine topological field theories for you. There's a, there's a correspondence between the right sort of, of quantum symmetry and the right sort of topological phases of matter. And this is a special case of this thing known as the Kerbordison hypothesis by, by Murray some years ago. Um, so that correspondence and, and Lurie's correspondence of made more specific in, in low dimensional cases by some other people is the, the reason why Talk to physicists by doing some maths. Okay, so let's get back up at the top where I'm, I actually need to tell you some maths for a little while. Uh, in a moment, we're going to, I'll give you particular axioms for a particular class of quantum symmetries, but to motivate those axioms, I want to talk about uh, finite groups and the way in which quantum symmetries are a generalization of the notion of a finite group. And we'll pull out from looking at that the actual axioms you want and get on from there. Okay. So finite groups. Well, what can we say? When, uh, when your G is some, some finite group, uh, rep G, so that's the, the category, there's objects, uh, there's the finite dimensional representations, uh, let's just say over the complex numbers to, be, to make everything as, as easy as possible, uh, and the morphisms are just the, the, the usual notion of morphisms and G representations. That gadget, well, it's obviously a, a category, and it's a very nice category in various ways. So first of all, uh, it's a monoidal category, Maybe known as a tensor category, uh, which just says that given two representations, V and W, you've got a sensible way of turning the vector space V tensor W into a representation G. It's just the usual formula. Uh, moreover, just like vector spaces have duals, uh, the category of representations of a finite group has duals. Again, it's the perfectly sensible and usual formula for defining uh, the action of a group on the dual vector space. Is, I guess, a functional in the dual vector space, and there's a vector. You can just uh, move all the symbols around in the right order and get an action of the group on the dual vector space. And those duals behave just the way you'd like them to behave 
in the sense that they behave just like dual vector spaces work. There's a there's a natural nat from uh, B dual tensor B back to the complex numbers. There's a nat the other way. Uh, those maps interact in exactly the same way the, the, the underlying types of vector spaces. So there's a nice theory of duals in this case. And finally, uh, when we're in this very nice situation of a finite group working over the complex numbers, uh, the category is semi-simple. And one easy way to, to say semi-simplicity is that there exists some finite set of representations, Bi, which have the property that they're sort of uh, they're sort of an orthonormal set. The, the homes from one of these Vi's to another Vj is just the complex numbers, and it's a scalar multiple of the identity, so it's easy to agree, and otherwise it's it's zero. Now we need more than just there exists a set of representations like that. Semi-simplicity is then saying that every every representation uh, broken up is a direct sum of those. Is everyone happy? Good stuff. Questions? There? Okay. So there are many, many other things that you can say about Rep G as a category when you know G was a, a finite group. Uh, you can go and learn about the character theory and character tables and all, all sorts of things. You can, you can also observe facts like that uh, V tensor W has a, has a natural isomorphism with W tensor B, which is a usual vector space map, and that plays well with the group actions. But forget all that stuff. I just want to think about these, these list of things so far. So that list of things is exactly the axiomatization of, that I want for the first sort of quantum symmetry school study. So, uh, yeah, okay. So this is just a definition of a, of a fusion category. So a fusion category, uh, I guess maybe it's easier to read this sentence backwards from uh, the tail end. So it's a category that's also monodal. So it's got a, a notion of tensor product. It's like tensor product of vector spaces. It's rigid. So that's saying that every object is a dual. We've got those evaluation and co-evaluation maps. Uh, that play nicely together, and finally it's finitely semi simple, in exactly the same sense as, as we saw for Rep G. It's a finite collection of objects that are all normal in that sense, and everything in between closes to the same. Okay, so I guess as I mentioned just a moment ago, some things aren't, aren't guaranteed by this definition that do hold in Rep G. There's no reason why these guys have to be isomorphic. There's also no uh, reason to expect just from these axioms that the Double dual of any object is actually isomorphic to the uh, to the object itself, uh, and I mean that's not surprising. Maybe and we know we know lots of categories other than finite dimensional vector spaces where this fails. Finite dimensional vector spaces typically don't have, have that. Uh, uh, this point is actually a very curious one. Uh, it's actually a conjecture at this point. At this point. Does actually automatic that does hold in all examples of fusion categories. It certainly holds in every example of many. I know it's the famous idea why, but this is a, a very strange mystery that we, that we don't understand the relationship between that result and these axioms. So, leave that for now. And very importantly, uh, there's no mention in these axioms for fusion categories of a free. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it, it, it appeared in the Russian literature, uh, okay, well, it's a good question of when. Um, probably, it must be early. Yeah, yeah there's, so. There's a list of things that are true. Well, I mean, it's just that the, the fact that, the, the, the simple idea is just that you, uh, because you've got a tensor product, you can just guarantee that everything decomposes into simple objects. If I give you two of those simple objects, vi and vj, and take their tensor product, we know that it decomposes as a direct sum over the simple objects. And so we can write it just as some, some multiplicity, which are just natural numbers, uh, times, the, uh, times the, 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 the dk's. And these numbers here are called the fusion coefficients. So it's just telling you that the, the, the multiplicity is tensor product. Uh, and it may be, moreover, if you've got this, this isomorphism here, this means that you have a collection of, of maps that you might uh, write as, you know, alpha i, j, k, l. So here, you've got a, where these represent morphisms from the i tensor v, j to v, k, and there are l of these where l goes from one up to the other. And 
IPK. If you draw an isomorphism, then you can actually write down the maps. There'll be morphisms in here, here. And these ones are called in the, in the physics literature, at least, and sometimes you have to translate them for a physicist. Those morphisms are called fusion channels. They are ways in which these two particles combine to return the channel. That's it. The origin. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, what's the role of uh, the movement of the dual not the white? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. So let me, let, me, let me spell this out. Uh, so, so we have uh, so for every object V, uh, we have V dual, and then we have a map called evaluation, which takes us from V dual tensor V back down to the tensor unit, and we have a coev, maybe a subscript goes by V, which goes from the tensor unit up to uh, the other way around, V tensor V dual. And let me draw these diagrammatically as Cap. So here the arrow going up says that that inputs a V while that inputs a V dual. And this I'll draw as a cup uh, that way, going from nothing to V tensor V dual. And then the axiom is just that, I mean, essentially that, that these are the, the same axioms you have for, for injunctions, it's just that this equals this. Arrows actually work before they did? No, that arrow's going to be the other one. Okay. So these are facts that are certainly true in vector spaces. Uh, and, and those are exactly the axioms that, that that's exactly the region. But notice this gives us no guarantee that, I mean, uh, one thing you can't do is necessarily have an evaluation map from V tends to be dual to one. We don't have a way of swapping tensor products. We don't have a way of, of using replacing double jewels with single jewels. So that's just something that might not be so valuable. You do get a natural map from V into a prime dual, though, don't you? Uh, no, you, you, I don't think you do in general. Um, if you have a braiding, you probably do, because you can do this. That cap with M V dual, maybe that cup with co -ev V, and I think that gave me a map the other way, which is mountain, but yeah, and I think in general you just you've got to do something tricky to even get a map. Uh, there is a theorem that says that V quadruple dual is asymorphic to V. And this is beautiful algebraic topology that, that explains that and gives you a good explanation of why that ought to be true. Uh, it's, it's about uh, what is it? Oh, I something. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I just need to mention here that there are many other things that, I mean, a quantum symmetry is not meant to be a, a precise definition for a particular thing. Okay, it's a, it's a general class of mathematical objects that we're interested in. A fusion category is one very interesting type of quantum symmetry, and maybe I should mention that modular tensor categories are another extremely interesting class. Planar algebra is lambda lattices. There are, there, are, there are a bunch of things that you might want to put under the head of quantum symmetry here. Okay. Any more questions about the, the definition? Yeah. So, what really is a quantum symmetry? Does that mean that the whole category? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, you should think the fusion category is the quantum symmetry. Yeah. The, a fusion category is a. Yeah. Is a like, just like a. I mean, a fusion category is a thing very much like a group. Okay? The, the, you should think. You've got some physical system that somehow has topological order, and its symmetry group is not a group. It's some monoidal category of symmetric properties. Okay, so any quantum symmetry would be an object of the category. Exactly. Oh, no, 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 not an object of the category. The whole category itself is the quantum symmetry. So, so this is a bit like the mountain philosophy that you don't have, you don't have the maps. Give me, give me one second, and, and we'll, 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 we'll go to Nazi in, in just a second. Uh, Oh, in the very next slide. Okay, good, good time. Uh, so, uh, there's a beautiful theorem of the Lenz that says that if you've got a symmetric fusion category, then it really is just rep fusion. Maybe with one little twist. So what does rep, what is, what does symmetric mean? Well, symmetric means you've got specified isomorphisms, V tensor W, 
the W tensor V, and these behave the way you'd expect. That is, you've got a whole lot of tensor factors, and you commute some of them according to some permutation. It only, the map you get only depends on the permutation, not the underlying sequence of transpositions. So that's a symmetric category. And Deline tells us, yeah, symmetric fusion categories are exactly Rep G for some finite group, with maybe a little awkwardness that maybe the associator on this tensor category would slightly modify it from the usual associator. And this is the notion of a finite super group. Uh, you, can, you can mostly ignore the, the super part. And so this is uh, meant to give you this idea that, that fusion categories are a non commutative analog of finite groups. Not, not, not abelian, but, but non commutative in the sense of non commutative geometry. Rather than taking a topological space and looking at continuous functions on it, noticing that's a commutative C-star algebra, and then going off and studying C-star algebras. Instead, what we're doing is taking a finite group, looking at functions on it, where functions now we're interpreting as representations of it. We're looking at the collection of representations of it, and we're forgetting the fact that it, that's symmetric, and going off and studying what we get. And that thing we get is this one. The first symmetry then does impose that V doesn't be in the original V. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I mean, this theorem definitely isn't relying on the fact that we're fusion here. It's semi simple with a with finite, with finite, finite, did I say finite? Oh dear, I think I left out a very, very important word. Uh, oh yeah, I, I did. Okay, finite set of representations, and here in the definition of fusion category, finite is semi simple. Yeah, that's absolutely essential for this theorem to go through like that. Yeah, you know. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's the, does this you know, answer your sort of question? It's the, it's the whole category that is analogous to the whole group. The, the elements of the group have no have no correspondence. There's a, no, it's just a very naive question. Yeah. I mean, we, we think of, like, we think of um, um, sort of a full like a collection of symmetry. Yeah. 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 And then an element of the group is any symmetry. Yeah. But we don't have that anymore. Yeah. I mean, just like in a C star algebra. When the C-star algebra isn't commutative, uh, there, there are no points of that space that you're talking about anymore. It's, it's a non-commutative yeah, yeah. space. It's exact, I think it's exactly the same. Yeah. I mean, one, one good way of thinking about this that Victor Osterich likes to promote is that a, a fusion, studying fusion categories, or maybe more generally studying monoidal categories, is, uh, is just studying linear algebra, the theory of vector spaces, where you just never ever allow yourself to mention points of the vector spaces. I mean, that's very, very close to the theory of the monoidal categories. Okay, so uh, I want to then tell you a little bit about this big story uh, that, uh, I mean, I, I, here I want to think of, of uh, this as being a, a second and perhaps independent reason to, to warrant studying fusion categories. The first one was that they are this quite natural generalization of this the theory of finite groups. The Lean's theorem tells us that they're the, the non-commutative version. But this is this is a sort of unexpected second uh, explanation for uh, for their importance. Okay, so this is the, these next two slides are definitely not intended to be precise. They're, they're textual. So. Uh, first of all, an, an n plus one dimensional topological field theory is a functor. So it's a gadget that for every n-dimensional manifold uh, spits out some vector space. So physicists would definitely say a Hilbert space at this point, and you should think it's the, the Hilbert states, the Hilbert space of possible states of, of your physical system if your universe is shaped like this manifold. And then for every n plus one dimensional cobordism, I guess in the different geometry seminar, I don't need to remind people what cobordisms are. Uh, it gives you a linear map between the vector space associated with the incoming boundary and the vector space associated with the outcoming boundary. And it's functorial in the sense that if you glue these, these surfaces top to bottom, the linear maps you get from Pose. Uh, and I probably should have, have some extra adjectives up there in front of functor. I would like it to be a monoidal functor. So if I have uh, the monoidal structure over here, is I can just take, just going, mm, I've got two manifolds, I can put them side by side. If I've got two cobordisms, I can put them side by side. And I'd like <coughs> the disjoint union of two cobordisms written side by side to be sent to the tensor product of the linear maps of the Okay. So that's, that part there is relatively well defined. 
This part I can't do justice to, uh, but uh, the idea of a, of a local TFT is that uh, it, it has some gluing rules that let you calculate these vector spaces and linear maps by slicing up these manifolds into smaller and smaller pieces uh, along higher and higher co-dimension uh, sort of facets. So you might imagine you want to know that you've got some 2 plus 1 dimensional TFT and you want to know the value on some 2-hole torus. Then if you've got a local TFT, it won't just associate a vector space to that surface. It'll associate some gadget to, uh, to the circle that run around the middle. In fact, it'll just be a, a category of some sort. And you'll associate some gadgets to the manifold with boundary on either side, is a function tori on either side, and in fact what it'll do is it'll associate to each side some module over the category that's associated with the circle. And the vector space obtained for the whole surface will just be the tensor product, the sort of amalgamated tensor product. This, this module tends it over this category, you can do this thing algebra if you want, tends it over this category or algebra with that module. Okay? But then we want to go even further down. We want to say that that circle there we can cut along some, some horizontal plane in the middle and maybe cut it at two points. And then we're, we're going to ask that the local TFT associate some even higher categorical object. It's going to associate some two category to the point and a two category to, to that point, presumably it's the same two category. And it'll associate something to that interval there, which will in fact be a, a bimodule between those two two categories. And the one category we've got for the circle will be built out of some sort of Iterated tensor product of that bi module with that bi module, and, and so on down. So, uh, okay, so the, the summary was that it didn't just give you something for n manifolds and n plus 1 manifolds, it gave you something for all k manifolds from n plus 1 all the way down to 0. Those things it gave you were, were higher categorical objects. And this fact that you can, this idea that you can compute by gluing is saying really that that, that association is functorial, it's some higher functor or functor. Oh. So, uh, what did Lurie prove for us? Uh, so there's this famous thing called the Kerbortism hypothesis that predates Lurie by quite a bit, which was called a hypothesis because the idea was at this point when it was made that there wasn't really a precise definition of any of the words and the intention was that one should provide definitions of all the words so that the hypothesis becomes a theorem. And Lurie subsequently did that for us. So the idea is that, well, if you've got a local TFT, then actually all of its values and all the higher dimensional manifolds are entirely determined by what it did to the point. Okay? And in fact, we have a complete classification of what the possible values of the point are. Okay? So I'm not going to attempt to explain what a fully dualizable end category but in summary, this theorem tells you that local TFTs are, are exactly in correspondence with fully dualizable end categories via just specializing to see what the TFT does at a point. Okay. Getting back to, to safer ground where we can, uh, well, slightly safer ground, uh, Chris Douglas, uh, Chris Schumacher, and Noah Snyder a while after Lurie actually told us what fully dualizable means. In, a, in a, some concrete sense, at n equals 2, and they told us that the fully dualizable two categories are exactly the fusion categories, or maybe the, the multi fusion categories. Uh, something that I omitted in the definition earlier uh, was that in a fusion category, uh, one, that is the, the, the monoidal unit, uh, should be simple. So that is, it should be one of those DIs that we have uh, and in a multi-fusion category. Uh, it means one itself might break up into several simple fusions. So it's a, it's a relatively minor, minor difference. Um, are you talking about fusion of two kinds of kind? No, okay, yeah, sorry. I, you know, good, good, good catch. Um, the, the thing that I'm doing here is using, there's a, there's a translation between uh, tensor categories and, uh, and two categories uh, with a single zero morphism. And the idea is you just put in the single zero morphism 
and they tend to call turtle, that is star. And then the one morphisms here are exactly the objects of, uh, of C. The C is our uh, tensor category. And then the two morphisms are the morphisms. But of course, if I'm thinking of, if I'm saying I've got a two category here, I need to be able to compose the one morphisms. And the composition is, of course, just tensor product. And the composition in the, in the horizontal direction here is just the tensor product of morphisms. So here I'm just saying that uh, a multi fusion category, in fact, is a, you can sort of push it across this translation and think of it as a two category. This theory. Uh, I think it makes sense. So is this saying that any topological language is just very much just the one definition of the topological language? What is it like? Uh, well, okay, so you, you have to do one further thing when you push across here. So if you, if you, if you have a multi-fusion category, which is a particular type of tensor category, and you push this across here, it won't be a general two category, because it'll, it'll have one object by definition of this construction. But, uh, now, but what we should do at this point is then um, sort of perform an item code completion. Say that this object here uh, really splits, you should think of it as splitting up as a sum of, of of smaller things because the identity morphism on it, the identity morphism being the tensor unit of this tensor category, uh, split up as a sum. And so really to make this, this make sense, you take a multi-fusion category, you bump it up a level in this way, and then you take an item code completion, and now you've got a two category that's got a okay. So uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm not gonna attempt to say anything further uh, on that one. Okay, so let's start. Um, giving a bit of a run through what's out there. We've, we've justified studying these things. We've said they're like finite groups. OK, sure. So there's lots of finite groups to give them examples. Rep G. You can also uh, just think of Vec G, the G-graded vector spaces for G of finite group as a fusion category. The simple objects are just the one-dimensional vector spaces sitting over a single group. The tensor product of these guys is just sort of the, like a convolution tensor product. You just multiply the, the pieces in each of the two group elements and put that over the product. You can take examples like this and make new examples uh, by twisting the associator. So in a monoidal category, there's always an associator that tells you how V tensor W tensor Z is isomorphic to V tensor W tensor Z. And when your category is just vector G, it's pretty easy to see you can modify that. If you've got one associator, you can modify it by a few cosine. So we get more examples there. And then we get a big class of examples that are in some sense generalizations of this one. So we can look at G extensions of and this is one of those very few ways in which we have analogs of in finite groups. You study, study finite groups by looking at simple groups and extensions of simple groups. That's one way of thing you can do. We don't have that sort of theory for fusion categories, but this is a, one of the limited directions we do have. So you can ask for some fixed fusion category C sub E, and then you can ask for a big fusion category, which is graded in the same sense this one is graded, really. Uh, so here, C E will be some fixed fusion category, and the and the C Gs will then be bimodule categories. So just like bimodules over a ring, you have bimodules over monoidal categories. It's just some category with which you can tensor an object of the monoidal category and get an object of the modular category. Okay, and it's a beautiful theory uh, where G extensions of a fixed category C are classified by some some some, some homotopy theory involving this thing called the, the Grauer Picard inquiry of your category. And we'll, we'll come back to that in just a little bit. So that's a, a whole range of examples telling you how to start from, from finite groups and maybe some cohomological data and uh, get, get fusion categories. The other very important, I mean, rather different class of examples are like quantum groups as a community. So if you take a, your favorite complex semi-simple Lie algebra, mine is SL2 and you uh, look at the quantized universal enveloping algebra. That's some crazy hot algebra with nice properties. And its representation category is a graded tensor category. Uh, when Q is a root of unity, the representation category itself is a, is a diffusion category, but it has a beautiful semi-simple quotient. There's some, there's some maximal ideal you can, you can get rid of, and uh, what remains is actually a diffusion category. And these are these things that simple objects of, uh, of uh, that's all three say are given by points in this file chamber and we set the right root of unity you cut off the file chamber at some extra wall and then there's some finite collection of symbols sitting inside that file algorithm. 
And so that's a, another class of, of, of fusion categories. In fact, these ones are all graded. You've got isomorphisms from V tensor W to W tensor V. But they don't behave as the symmetric group. They only behave as the braid group. OK. Uh, there's another class of examples people have come up with, uh, mostly from Masaki Azumi's work. Uh, so these are, these are ones that are quite like the VEC G examples in the sense that there are, there are tensor categories with a bunch of invertible objects, that is, uh, objects, um, so objects, so an object is invertible if there's another object W, so that the, the tensor product is isomorphic to the, to the tensor unit. And it's pretty easy to see that the invertible objects under tensor product, or the isomorphism class of the invertible objects under tensor product form a group. Okay? And that group acts on, the, on the, the isomorphism classes of objects in the category just by tensoring with that, with that invertible object. So Azumi's quadratic categories are these ones where you've got some, some group, maybe Z3, uh, worth, of, worth of, of objects that are invertible. And then there are some other objects, but they just form a single orbit. So you've got some G tensor X. Sorry, so we've got oh, X, G tensor X, and G squared tensor X as the, uh, as, as the complete list of simple objects. Now, that's a kind of strange thing to do. I mean, these were studied more or less out of desperation as, we, uh, as people started realizing it was hard to classify fusion categories. And we decided to just try this case. And he got a sort of beautiful answer in the sense that for every finite group and uh, for every transitive action of that finite group, he can completely parameterize the possible fusion categories whose simple objects are described by that group and that action. It's in a slightly indirect way. He gives you some system of polynomials uh, and tells you that uh, the solutions of these polynomials are in bijection with the fusion categories having objects that behave like that. And some other theory, in fact, guarantees that that variety cut up by those polynomials is discrete. It's just some finite set of points. So in some sense, that's a classification of these categories. But uh, it's, it's a little unsatisfying. We don't even know that there are infinitely many examples of this type, even if you just take cyclic groups and the, the boring action of a cyclic group. Uh, it appears that for every cyclic group, there are is one of these categories behaving like this, but we've only done this up in finitely many cases, and there's, there's no general theory yet. So it's a little, that's a little bit of a mess, uh, but there are a large number of examples that fall into that area. You might then ask, well, like, why don't you just start looking at like, a group of invertible objects and two other orbits of objects and see what you get there? And you can try various directions like that, and you basically find nothing. Uh, every, or, to the extent that people have, studied, have, have tried this sort of approach to looking at the next range out of objects, uh, they just find things that were back in these, in these classes again, so kind of boring, boring examples in some sense. Uh, so this is a sort of strange uh, liminal class of, of, of these categories, just outside the boring ones, uh, but as far as we can tell, it doesn't go too, too far. Okay, and then, there's this strange gadget called the Extended Hagerup Fusion Category, which is a terrible name that is partly my fault. At least I, I probably could have helped change the name at a critical moment, um, but we didn't. So it's still got a terrible name. Um, the confusion is that there's another category called the Hagerup Fusion Category, which in fact we now understand is an example in this class. And the Extended Hagerup Fusion Category has almost nothing to do with the Hagerup. Referees routinely fail to appreciate this distinction. Uh, okay. And now the really provocative observation is that perhaps there's not much else. This probably just represents our complete ignorance and our inability to look much further and to construct examples. Uh, quite likely, this guy is just the first case of an endless sea of junk that's unclassifiable and all exist for no good reasons. That's the depressing version. Uh, the exciting version is perhaps that there used to be more things on this list, and then we've understood how relatively simple constructions fold them back into 
to the simple classes of things. Uh, and the, the optimistic, but maybe not particularly honest, well, not, I don't want to say honest, maybe not the, the, the optimistic version is that we have looked at quite a bit further through examples, and we've failed to find them, and you can decide, it's, it's hard to decide whether we just haven't looked very far because we're stupid, or, or it's some sign that there's maybe not much more, and perhaps this is a special object outside of outside of these classes. It's, it's still, I think, very unclear <coughs> whether we're going to end up with saying, oh, fusion categories are finite groups and quantum groups, constructions built out of those, and a handful of other cases, or it's going to be something big and messy. I think we, that's the big question. Okay, so I'm going to spend a few minutes at the end here just telling you about this strange object, extended hugger. Uh, so it was first discovered uh, in a language that didn't mention fusion categories at all. People first noticed this object in studying uh, subfactors, and a, uh, the, the algebraic analog of, of the theory of, of subfactors, or at least finite depth subfactors, is to study a pair of fusion categories and a Morita equivalence between them. So a Morita equivalence is just like a Morita equivalence in ring theory. It's some bimodule category between two categories, where M may be a CD uh, bimodule category, so it's a tensor object of C and M, the object of M, and so on. And then saying that it's a, a Morita equivalence is saying that uh, if you take M and M bar, or whatever that is, and tensor those over D, that's isomorphic as a CC bimodule to C. As a CC by module, and similarly the other way around. So that one can one can boil down a big fraction of the early subject literature into into studying this situation now recast in the language of fusion categories. So extended hardware was first noticed in that world, and we've got it presented in, in the categorical world. So okay, so it was first noticed as a pair of categories, EH1 and EH2. I'll just mention EH1 for a second. It's some relatively small thing. It's got six, six simple objects. So it, if you want to think of it as being like a finite group, it's a small finite group with uh, its six irreducible representations. And it's generated as a tensor category by just two morphisms. So there's some map from uh, F2 tensor F2 back to F2, and there's some map S, which picks out an, an invariant vector in the eighth tensor power of F2, that is picking out a copy of the trivial inside F2 to the tensor power of F8. And the sense in which when we, when we say that a tensor category is generated by morphisms, we should always draw pictures for morphisms in tensor categories like we were drawing here. You can compose morphisms by stacking them vertically and tensor them by, by putting them side by side. And when we say it's generated, we just mean that every morphism uh, is built out of some planar network of, uh, of, of those specified morphisms. Where, where you then interpret this planar diagram in terms of complicated sequence of things. Okay. Um, so that's a bit of a, a strange story. Uh, those, two, those two generators I wrote satisfy some quite bizarre at first list of, of relations. But they're actually very nice eventually when you, when you think about them a little bit. Uh, and the very, very roughly, the idea to, to prove that this case had existed when we, when we did that was first of all to show that using this list of relations here, you can take any closed diagrams, so any morphism from the tensor unit to the tensor unit built out of those generators, and use those relations to see that that was just some scalar morphism of the identity map from the tensor unit to the tensor unit. And that's, in some sense, a sort of unique use of the world. It says that these, rela these relations are uniquely specified at most one category. And then you have to show that it exists by, uh, by, by faithfully representing this object, finding uh, sort of an embedding into something where you can see that these generators, S and the trivalent vertex in the center, something non-zero. And uh, at the very last minute of the talk, I'll probably come back to that. Uh, the very rough idea of this first point, and the reason why this is called the jellyfish relation, is that you've got some big planar network of, of these guys. You can use a relation like this to, to float the jellyfish to the surface. This guy here can pass through the stream that's running over the top of it, perhaps turning into lots of jellyfish, but now it's a little bit closer to the surface. You float all the jellyfish up 
until you've got a, a line of jellyfish sitting on the, the surface of the sea, and then some big tangle of tentacles, possibly with trivalent vertices hanging underneath them. Then, just thinking about trivalent graphs in the plane and using this relation a little while, you realize that floating on the surface somewhere, you can either find a pair of, of jellyfish connected by four strings, or a pair of jellyfish connected by four strings with, with one trivalent vertex hanging down. In either of those cases, you can reduce the number of jellyfish. You float everything to the top and combine pairs all the way down to having nothing at the surface. And finally, use this relation to clear up any tentacles left at the bottom. So there's a beautiful topological argument going into the proof that these relations specify at most one category. Okay. Um, well, okay. So that's fine. There's some strange construction of this, of this category. Uh, but at this point, we want, to, we want to know what's going on. That construction wasn't particularly illuminating. Uh, in some sense, it was a sort of general purpose construction of a, of, a, of a strange object. OK, so, well, how can we answer whether it's exotic or not? Well, we, can, we could possibly prove that it's not exotic by describing some new construction that relates it back to old things. Or perhaps we could find instructions that some invariant of this thing that doesn't change under all the construction we know that distinguishes it. Finding group and quantum field cases. We thought for a while we had some evidence of that, but I think that we were being a bit short sighted about what sort of constructions we figured out. Really, what we'd like to do is find easier constructions of it, give, build it out of, the, out of the earlier pieces. And so, uh, when we've been studying this strange object since its discovery, we've, we've, we've been trying to study two things about it. Uh, one is, is, its, is its Grunfeld center. So anytime you have a fusion category with one extra object, you've got this Grunfeld center Z of C, and that's a modular tensor category. Nearly everything about the, the TFT for your fusion category is determined solely by the Grunfeld center. And there's a very intimate, although slightly poorly understood, correspondence between modular tensor categories and conformal field theory. Conformal field theory. Uh, and certainly when you ask the right sort of conformal field theorists, they will promise you, cross their heart, hope to die, that every modular tensor category is realizable as the category of representations of some conformal field theory. And so if we come along and give them some supposedly exotic object, they promise that they can come up with a conformal field theory that realizes it. Now they can't do that at the moment, but uh, they, they, one of the reasons why we, we, we want to pin down this object is because we really want to make connections from so hopeful dreams that can do much of the modular tensor category. And then we also want to study the graph of Tartary void. So very briefly, this is not just the fusion category that we started with the study, but all other fusion categories for which there exists a merida equivalence uh, from your original fusion category to some other one. And the graph of Tartary void also keeps track of some higher data as well. It keeps track of the, the bimodule between your fusion category and the other one and it keeps track of equivalences between different bimodule categories and so on. So there's some, some just complicated homotopical data. Okay, I'll keep, okay, Drinfeld Center, we've, we basically have pinned down uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, we've worked out all of the modular data, which is these S and T matrices, anyone's ever seen those. Uh, there's some arguments, lots of Galois theory and combinatorics and some representation theory. And the thing that studying the modular data has revealed is that there's a very, very strange looking connection to the quantum group F4 and level 4. It's, it's purely a numerical coincidence at this point that doesn't really hint at any constructions. But uh, for any time you have a modular tensor category, you get these S and T matrices, which give you uh, a, uh, a representation of, uh, let me get the relation of the, uh, some, uh, of the of the, the modular group, and uh, they have all sorts of these things have all sorts of amazing properties. And what we realized is that there's actually a very large block down here in the S matrix for, for extended Hargrove, which basically repeats exactly a large subblock of the S and T matrices for F four at level four. Uh, we know of no categorical constructions that can do this that can sort of paste a chunk of one S matrix into another S matrix. So it's pretty strange. Uh, but it's a big chunk. And these are complicated numbers in some strange number field, satisfying ridiculous properties. 
so it's sort of it's it's hard to ignore at this point uh, that there seems to be some connection there. And so I think a lot of what I'm thinking about these days with this is trying to guess categorical constructions that could possibly reflect those sort of behaviors on the modular data. Okay, and then the Brouwer Picard groupoid, um, we finally have pinned down. Uh, the archive reference doesn't quite exist yet. Uh, uh, I think my co authors are all angry at me that it's not online yet, um, but I tell them next week. Um, I mean, so I think they were very, very close. And mostly the news is sad. The, the, the summary of this paper is we completely decipher the Brouwer Picard groupoid of these examples. And there's some very simple groupoid, four points and one arrow between each pair of points. Uh, and the really sad thing is that the new things that appeared are equally strange as the things that we started with. When I, formed, when I previously said I, we had this list and there used to be a few other exotic things at the bottom of the list, the reason they're gone now is that we eventually get, get described the Brouwer Brow Picard groupoids and we realized that other things in the Brouwer equivalence class had easy constructions from the point of view of the planet groups or zooming categories. And that just doesn't happen here. Uh, the, the nice news maybe is that uh, we developed some, some really nifty technology for studying reader equivalences and modules for, for fusion categories, which uh, explains, which simultaneously explains some mysterious calculations that people used to do in the subvector literature and gives you a really effective tool for, for calculating, for producing module categories, constructing module categories, and so on. And I think one of the, the reason for anyone to ever read this paper that will be out next week is maybe not unless you one of the few people in the world that cares about extended hard group, and I know you're not, this is very true. Um, the, um, the reason is not really this example, but because we, we really, in this paper, because we need to use techniques both in the subfactor literature and the tensor category literature, we explain everything from scratch and really explain why these techniques about embedding in graph algebras and so on uh, lets you build module categories. Okay, I think I better stop there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Is that what it's Yeah, so I mean, the, it, it, I mean, it tells you the extension theory of these categories. You want G-graded extensions with a, with a neutral piece in one of these categories. Yeah. And it tells you that extension theory is very boring. So the, what is in the process of this for brain coordinates? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. That's a that's a excellent question. So, the the yeah to to um, to make this it's very <laughs> this theorem when I quote these guys it's very sad because you won't find a theorem stated like this in their paper, um, but it's 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 very close to being it. So if you're right to make it true, I need to put in something about uh, the, the fully dualizable two categories with the SO2 or SO3 homotopy fixed point structure out of these guys. But this, this, this one is, this statement is meant to be telling you that the multi-fusion categories are the things that classify the, the unframed, just the oriented. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, you're, you're absolutely right, there should be extra adjectives on this side. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of different directions in which people have attempted classifying. So, one is um, the dimension of the smallest. So, every object individually has a dimension, like representations of groups have dimensions. Those, no, those dimensions no longer need to be integers in this world because there's no underlying vector space. So, we can classify out to about, I think, about 2.2 these days. <laughs> It's not maybe not very far. Um, you can classify also by the total, the global dimension, the sum of the squares of all the dimensions, which is like the order of a group. And there we can get out to about 30. Maybe not that impressive from the from view from the group view. Uh, and in terms of the number of simple objects, is even worse. Uh, the classification with two objects is nowadays easy. You can give a 
with modern technology, you can give a 10 minute explanation of the classification of two object fusion categories. Three is, is done and is, is okay. I think three still relies on the extra adjective pivotal that every object V is isomorphic to its double dual, whether or not that comes to free, we still don't know. And then four simple objects is still open. Four simple objects is actually mostly done. There's like a corner case where we, we don't know how to answer yet. Uh, and then five and above opens. Uh, there is a conjecture that there are only finitely many at each rank. And some analogs of that theorem have been proven now. So like for modular tensor categories, that's now a theorem. Fusion categories, it's still open but widely expected. Yeah, the, 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 the exhaustive classification technique of sort of techniques only look a tiny little epsilon neighborhood around the origin state. So um, how are the um, constraints for the transformative fusion are using um, the fusion dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, this paper that I mentioned where we calculate the SMT matrices has a whole section in it about the conformal field theory side um, where uh, we can uh, we can basically calculate uh, the possible vector valued modular forms that you would get from a conformal field theory that realized one of these fusion categories. And that in particular then gives you, because you, you know the possible vector valued modular forms and there's only finite many possible, ve possible vector valued modular forms, that reads off for you the dimensions of the, the, the vertex algebra, the dimensions of all its modules, and so on. So we have, we have quite, I mean, there's all these numerical constraints about the sizes of the algebras and the, and the modules. Uh, no, Terry Gannon, my co-author on that stuff, uh, has thought a lot about uh, how you work out what the V1 piece, what the Lie algebra part of your vertex operator algebra is, and he can say some things, but that, that's not come down. Now, 